James 1 in our Bibles. The children can be dismissed to their, their class downstairs this week. Right? We go back downstairs. We have this uh, issue in the summers where there's no heat, no air conditioner here. And uh, so we all go downstairs, uh, and it's kind of a closer fellowship down there. The singing you can hear louder. Um, and, uh, and so when we come up here, the, the lighting is dimmer, and uh, it's a little more difficult. Your, your singing goes straight, to, straight up, which is great, because maybe the Lord will hear it. But, but uh, you can't hear each other singing as much. So we, we need your help. Sing louder. You do need to sing louder in, in you know, the rest of the, the year. But also, we just need to fill up all the pews. All right, so we have a few empty pews. A uh, few seats around you, and I need your help this fall. Uh, by the end of the fall, we just need to make sure all the pews are full, and I think then we will be able to hear one another better. Okay, so that is the solution. I know uh, Jer and I will be will be handing out thousands of invitations this September uh, on Fridays, right? So we're going to be kind of pounding the pavement that way, and uh, and yet we still need your help too. You can uh, invite. If we can invite thousands, you can invite a few. So maybe think through some folks that you can uh, bring back and help fill up these pews so that uh, your voices sound great, but, but the way the building's built, it kind of goes up. And uh, it would help if, uh, if we filled all the seats. So we'll work on that, okay? Work on that with me? I hope so. And uh, that, would be, that would be fun. That would be fun. Well, a few things uh, before we get to our text here, just a couple things to pray about. We do want to uh, pray for our friends and many family, I'm sure, in Florida as uh, they're bracing for this hurricane and actually under it now. Um, but uh, just ask the Lord to give um, safety. Think of the first responders, uh, as Jack mentioned, reporters, right, as you see their hair being blown off and you're Maybe you should not be reporting there. But uh, folks that are, are staying, uh, then, then uh, just think of how the Lord kind of answered our prayer there in Houston and how they got up and running very quickly. We can pray the same for many, many more in Florida, all across the West Coast now, it seems. Um, but let's just, just ask the Lord to use this as we did with the other. You know, it, it may be us next week. <laughs> you just... Uh, you just never know, and, and so we always need to be ready, always need to be ready for uh, whatever the Lord brings our way. Uh, the Lord often brings these things, allows these things. We know they come because the curse, because there's a fallen world that's broken that God is fixing and will fix completely one day, but uh, also that in these times of uncertainty and trial and difficulty, people turn to Him. So we just need to pray that people will turn to him for safety, turn to him for deliverance. Okay, so that's what our prayer is for safety, but also for spiritual healing, that people would come to God as their source of safety. So let's pray for that. Also, we want to pray for little Ella, uh, Jeremy and Dina's new baby. Thank the Lord for, the, for Tracy, uh, new baby there. Uh, and, and thank the Lord for that. But, but uh, this week, Ella uh, went in f uh, f as a, for fever, and with the difficulty uh, with the cyst, they, they're keeping her in the hospital uh, Friday all the way till now. She's still in the hospital. So pray for Jer and Dina as they work through this, but also that the fever would... Um, they're, they're waiting on test results that they would know the issue and be able to treat little Ella and go forward with the surgery on Friday. All right, so that's our prayer that, that would, uh, all that would be taken care of, but also pray for mom and dad there as they're in the hospital and, and looking over uh, baby Ella. All right, so let's pray together and then we'll uh, jump into this text together, James 1, 22 to 25, as we look at... Um, God changing us, right? God's pathway to blessing. Let me read this text and then we'll pray together. <clears throat> but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hear hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. Once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. 
But who one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Let's pray. Lord, we come again to you in this service. This is your service. This is where we're focusing on you. We want to show you the worth and the honor that you are due. And so, Lord, we pause in this busy week and we set aside this day as your day. And right in the middle of this day, we give this time to you as a corporate body to worship you. And you've told us that when we gather together, your, your spirit is uniquely present that you, plural, the church, plural, gathered together, is the temple. And so, dear Spirit, as you meet in this place, we pray that this would be a holy union as we meet together as brothers and sisters. May we meet unified together around this holy word, hearing from you, dear Holy Spirit, as you are with us. Father, as you're hearing our sacrifices of worship and praise, we are not singing or listening as spectators. You are the one listening to all of us as a voice raised, as incense offered. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the sacrificial lamb that has made this possible, that has opened up the way into the holiest of holies, even by bringing your blood, the blood of the perfect lamb, into the holiest of holies, that once for all now we do not wait for another sacrifice, but we come boldly into the very presence of our Heavenly Father. Respectfully, but boldly, we claim the blood of Jesus. And we ask that now you would meet your body's needs. You would tend to those who are needy in heart. Tend to us in areas that we need to be rebuked. May you exhort through your word with power. And I pray that we would change and leave as those who have been admonished to walk in the way. And those who are equipped to walk in the way. Instructed, this is the way, walk in it. Lord, may you do this in a special way today in this room, but all throughout your church as it meets together in different locations, manifestations of your body. May the church in Asia and Africa and Central America, South America, all over this globe, Europe, may, may the church gathered be built up by the, the word preached. Lord, we ask this for your glory, because we would not want any glory of our own. We claim the glory of Jesus. Lord, we do want to ask that you would be with our brothers and sisters in Florida as they um, fear, as some have evacuated, what may happen to their stuff. And others that have stayed are, in one sense, concerned for their livelihood, physical well-being. I pray that you would comfort them today. Those who would be the first to respond in an emergency, that you would be with them and give them clear thinking. Um, but Lord, I pray that we would see a similar thing, that, that they would be able to quickly maneuver through the what's left behind. And Lord, you would uh, even weaken the effects of the storm, we pray. And I pray that um, you would keep your, your, your children safe. Lord, there may be those that are going through this who are not your children. They've never prayed even because they've been so self-assured. I pray that in their weakness they would call to you and you would be a God of comfort. We think of John Newton, that wicked man that was so hardened and it was a storm that um, made his heart tender and he cried for mercy was saved. I pray that you would do that now in this storm, that someone would cry for mercy and be saved eternally. We pray that you would do that. I pray for Jer and Dina, little Ella. We pray for Ella's uh, healing, and Lord, would you heal her today? Pray that uh, this fever would be gone, and the doctors would know what the problem is and be able to treat her, and that she would have a successful surgery on Friday 
bring her back to full health, we pray. So we ask for you to do that, and again, for your blessing in our uh, the text that we consider this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. James 1, look at God's steps to blessing. God's steps to blessing. Um, one thing I, I love to do whenever I get a chance to is to walk under a ladder. I don't know if you've ever done that. You see a ladder... And, and maybe it's up against a wall uh, or whatnot, and you just walk right under it. The reason I do that is because others will not do it, and they're super superstitious because the, there's this idea of walking under a ladder is bad luck. Well, sometimes it's just not wise because you don't know who's up there, and they may be dropping bricks or a bucket of paint, right? So sometimes you don't do it because, because it would be silly to do that. But you don't do it because you feel like Man, I'm going to do that and there will be bad luck. Um, I think the guy who started that had his ladder knocked out from under him by someone walking by. Maybe he started the superstition. Probably not. According to live science, the superstition came from ancient Egypt. Respect, respecting triangles in some superstitious way. And so you're not to walk through there. 1600s, uh, some who were to be executed, were forced to walk under a ladder to play up this superstition. There are crazy superstitions out there, and, and maybe you have some that you don't want to share. Um, there's some that say this black cat crossing your pathway is bad luck, right? Uh, so I feel sorry for those who, who's, who own black cats. Uh, actually, this uh, same website said that they were revered in ancient Egypt, thought to be good luck. Uh, so our, our poor feline friends have had their, their right, respectability torn, turned upside down, and now they become a bad omen. The idea of evil and witchcraft in these, these they're just cats. They're just cats. It's just a ladder. And perhaps you have superstitions that kind of ingrain you, and, and you kind of have a hard time getting over them. It's not that simple. The way to blessing or cursing being a cat or a ladder. But our text does give us today the way to be blessed. The way to be blessed. And it says nothing about these, but look at the last phrase of our text. You read on James 1, 21, you keep going and, and we're going to look at these verses. And the end of verse 25 says, this person will be blessed in what he does. So if we continue on and concentrate and understand these verses, we will know at the end how I can be a blessed person, how I can be blessed by God. I want that. And you should want that. Yeah, that's not bad to want. I want God's hand of blessing on my life, on me as a person, on my family. So how can I do that? Well, let's pay attention. Let's listen to the text. We'll get there in just a second, verses 21 to 25, as we'll look through today. But if I could zoom out a little bit and just recover where we are in James, as we go verse by verse through this book, we're seeing that it's about overcoming. Faith works in our lives in overcoming many things, many obstacles. The first obstacle was overcoming trial, verses 1 through 12. Consider it all joy, my brethren, you encounter various trials. That is overcoming trial, verse 2. Then verses 13 to 27, really the end of the chapter, we're seeing overcoming temptation. Recognize the source to overcoming temptation. And then the last couple weeks, we skipped it for Joshua last week, but the last few weeks we saw steps to overcoming temptation in verses 19 to 25. Listen to the word, verses 19 and 20. Receive the word, verse 21. And then today we begin this, obey the word. Obey the word. Be doers of the word and not just hearers. And so as we obey the word, verses 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, there's that command to obey that we'll look at today. But then next week starts evidences of obeying the word, very practical evidences in verses 26 to 27, it finishes out the chapter that way, and that's really a springboard for the rest of the book. 
So we look at this text, the way to blessing. Part of that is this overcoming temptation. This, the, the passage itself is very straightforward. It uh, gives us, as we go through it, a warning. Verse 22, there's this warning. Prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. And then from the warning, he gives reasons to heed that warning. Two reasons to heed that warning. Well, it's kind of like if you're driving along, going to the beach or wherever, and Google Maps gives you another route. And it tells you, Tim, you continue to go that way, the road's out, you'll fall in a cliff, and you'll die. Change to this route, and you'll have clear sailing. It'll actually be a shortcut, and you'll get there quicker. You're going to dismiss that, or are you going to accept the new route? Accept the new route. Right? And so what the text gives us is this command in verse 22. And it gives us two reasons to heed or listen to that command. One is negative. You go that way, and this is going to happen to you, so don't go that way. That's verses 23 and 24. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his face in a mirror. Right? And then this is negative. He, he's not going to listen. Once he has looked, he goes away and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. Then the second warning is positive, right? Listen to this, heed this, for this is what happens if you do heed it. So it gives you a positive reason to obey. Verse 25, the one who looks intently at the perfect law abides by it. This man will be blessed. And that's the positive heed. So let's look at this summary warning in verse 22. Verse 22, James 1. Prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Let's walk through the warning and then we'll look at those reasons to heed the warning. Verse 22, the warning. The command itself is be a doer, not just a hearer. And then he gives the cause for an action. So first of all, this command, be a doer. The summary, really, of a big part of James. Faith works. <laughs> it, it doesn't just stay up here. It, it leaves and it does it. It goes from practice, I'm going from theology to practice, from thinking the right things to doing the right things. Someone says, yes, I believe this plane is out of fuel. It's going to make a crash landing. I believe I have 20 seconds to put on this parachute and jump out the window in order to live. I believe that. And you say, you don't believe it or you'd be putting it on, right? Faith believes it and it works. It puts the parachute on and it jumps out. The Bible tells us not just to be hearers of the word, but doers. This is his this word, doer, be a doer. Now it occurs six times in the New Testament. Four of them are in James. Three of them are in this passage. Be a doer, not just a hearer. So that's part of the command, right? Prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers. So this is a possibility. All right? Be a doer, the command, and not just a hearer. It's a possibility for someone to be a hearer of the word and not a doer. It's the main point of his message for us today from the Bible. All of you here today, you're a hearer. Great, good, first step. But all of us will leave in one of two categories. You're a hearer and a doer, or you're just a hearer. It's, it's, it's up to you. You're hearing the word, great, but it's possible to listen to sermons, it's possible to read your Bible, to even memorize your Bible and never benefit if you leave without becoming a doer of the word. One of my favorite authors writing on this book is Dr. Hebert, James Hebert. He says, among the Greeks, it was this was a common term, this hearer only, for a person who were a attending a lecture, but not a disciple of the lecturer, right? So they're listening, 
to what's being said, but they're not a follower of the person who's teaching. It's possible for you to be listening to what Jesus says in his word, but, but not be a disciple, not be a follower, not be obeying. You're seeing it, but you're not hearing. This is scary. There are people who teach the Bible, know the Bible, but are not doing the Bible. 1700s, this was fascinating because um, the Great Awakening was sweeping all over America. Like 80% of the people in America heard um, George Whitfield preach. Many of them became born again believers, changed the country. Well, this time, you have people becoming saved, born again, having spiritual life. And then you have places like Yale. I don't know if you realize this, but Yale, Harvard, Princeton were actually started to um, teach pastors how to be pastors, Christian pastors. So here's Yale, supposed to be teaching Christian pastors, but by that point, 1740s, some, a lot of these professors didn't even know God. They had no relationship with God. It all is academic. They're just studying the Bible to study spouting forth even sometimes correct theology with no heart great awakening comes the student body hears jonathan edwards george whitfield the need for spiritual birth a lot of them are born again and so you have professors who are unbelievers teaching students who are born again believers not a good mix one of them is david brainerd um spiritually alive student listening to dead teaching and, and they got so contentious that they had to make a rule that if you are speaking against a professor saying that they are not born again, you will be expelled after the second offense. And Brainerd says, my teacher has no more grace than a chair. He has no more spiritual life than a chair does. And he's expelled. He's expelled. And they don't re-enter him because it just doesn't mix. Went and, went and actually became a missionary to Native Americans and had you know, uh, fruit uh, among Rhode Island. Um, but Christian in name, hearers, even professors in seminary, from that they started Princeton because they're fed up with what was happening even in that situation. Um, and then the same thing happens everywhere. It's good to be a hearer. Hearing's first, but that hearing must sink into the soul a, a transformed life that is spiritually alive, that is changing, progressively sanctifying more and more like Jesus, or you're just a hearer. Are you a hearer today and not a doer? One of the causes of that, he continues on, might be this. What's the cause of an action? You're deluding yourself. Perhaps you're a hearer and not a doer because you're deceiving yourself. The word delude is to deceive by false reasoning. It's the idea of, of calculating incorrectly. I mean, that person comes to the quiz and they come to their professor and they say, I know this is the right answer, but they're dead wrong. They made their calculations wrong. Well, you can be standing in there and say, I know I'm in the right. I know I'm in the, but you are dead wrong because you're deceiving yourself. It's possible this morning that you're actually delusional. You're self-deceived about your spiritual state. You say, I'm okay, I'm listening, I'm hearing, I'm listening to sermons, I'm memorizing scripture, but you're not letting it change you. There's no volition involved. You're still stuck in sin. Then you're souring. As one person put it, our churches are filled with spiritual sponges who soak up the information, sit, sour, and eventually stink. Problem with that is when there's a bunch of stinky Christians, it gives Christ a bad name. We need to be changing day by day into the image of Jesus. It's like a person who loves fishing. Love fishing so much that they ignore that their little boat has a hole in it. Rowboat, they go out there, they're casting their net, maybe they're fishing, fly fishing. 
they see the water trickling through a hole, but they're just so, they're just enjoying that, you know? And then, then they see there's a puddle, not just a trickle. But they just ignore it. They're just enjoying it. But just, you know, I could do half an hour more. Water continues to rise, continues to rise, starts filling their shoes. And they're just deceiving themselves. Just one more cast. Still fishing. And then it sinks. It sinks. They've deceived themselves. It's possible that you deceive yourselves till you sink. You sink. You read this of the heroes of the past. Old Testament, David, Solomon, Samson destroy their lives by immorality. Solomon, who wrote so much about marital purity and was the worst example. You can't take fire without getting burnt. Don't let your heart lie to you. I just want to read this verse here. It's a very important verse. Um, some people say, well, my heart just kind of feels okay about this. Listen to this verse, what, what Jeremiah, what God actually tells us about our heart. The heart is more deceitful than all else. Be careful about listening to your heart. If you think you're okay because your heart says you're okay, you may just be deceived. The heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick incurably sick. Who can understand it? The Lord can. He searches our heart and our mind. And we say, Lord, test my heart. Test my mind. Show me if there be any wicked way in me. This inner thinking of the heart is able to justify all types of sin. It's able to deceive your own heart. And so we need a heart transplant, but we need that heart to continue to be growing in the word, listening watching, changing. Let me just give one more quick application about this and we'll move on to the second point here. But uh, as brothers and sisters, let's be open with one another. This is the benefit of a church, a local church of brothers and sisters because we see one another fishing. And, and you may see, Tim, Tim, look, your, your boat, it's filling up with water and I'm just fishing. I'm just enjoying fishing and fishing. Tim, it's getting deeper. It's getting, and, 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 and you start bailing water for me. And you say, look, there's the hole. And you're not whispering, look at Tim's boat. Look what he's stuck in. Oh, I bet he'll sink. That's not what you're doing as brothers and sisters. Right? Or the boat sinks and you're laughing. That's, you're not laughing. You're, you're grieved. Let's help. Right? And so we come alongside and it's not to, we, we help. We say, Let's get, the, let's get the water out. Tim, come on, let's look at what's happening in your life. And we help one another. We help our brothers and sisters. But also we need to be approachable when someone brings something to our attention. And they may be wrong. Tim, I saw that in your life and I'm just wondering. And I just say, no, no, my boat's fine. Okay, but at least we should be engaged in like that. And, and if, if you see something in my life, you should be able to approach me about it graciously. And sitting ourselves, lest we're also tempted. That's the warning. Be doers and not hearers only who delude themselves. Then he gives us two reasons to heed that warning. Take a moment now to look at the first reason. We're saying the, the first reason is negative, And by that I mean it's telling us what not to do. That's verse 23. And then verses 24 and 25 tell us positively what we should do, the, the positive reason. So heed the warning. Why? Well, this is what happens if you don't heed the warning. Verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. Once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. So here's this really interesting natural illustration of what may happen to you if you don't heed his word. Three verbs here in this. Uh, three verbs we look at. He, he looks. Okay, and this looking is, is not a casual glance. So it's actually talking about uh, coming to grips with and, and looking carefully. But then it, 
The, the issue is after that, they walk away from the mirror. They don't do business there. They don't remain there until the issue is taken care of. Right? The second verb is what? They, they've gone away. They've walked away. And what happens when they walk away? They immediately forget. They immediately. The, 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 all right, the, the word is giving us this interesting picture of someone looking in a mirror. Right? And in that day, it would have been polished brass. Right? So it's not a, the clearest image. So you kind of have to look a little closely to see the problems there. And, uh, of course, you all look in the mirror and there's no problems at all. But I look at the mirror and say, wow, i got to take care of this. Uh, but walk away and boom, it's out of my mind. He's saying, this is what happens. But I immediately forget what. And this is where he gets to the spiritual application of this natural illustration. Natural illustration is they look in a mirror, they walk away quickly, they immediately forget what they see. The spiritual application is you immediately forget what kind of person you are. What type of person you saw that you are. So it's not just talking about uh, a little mustard on my chin. It's talking about the spiritual man and woman that's in the mirror of God's word. And so we see here, you're looking at the mirror in the natural illustration. You're walking away quickly. You immediately forget what you see. The spiritual application of those is looking at the mirror, is looking at the Bible and seeing areas that need to change in my own life. But this is what happens at times. We read it kind of, you know, you got five minutes and you take a paragraph or a verse and then you walk away quickly. There's no way for the word to seep down into your soul. You walk away and immediately you forget what kind of person it just said you were. And you go back to fishing. Immediately forget what you see. You forget all that you need to change, thinking that you're all, I'm all good. I'm okay. It's a bit comical, the illustration. Right? Someone sees they need to comb their hair. They have some dinner stuck in their teeth. They look at the mirror and they see the problem. And they're just happy. Just like, whatever. And they go to the next person. can happen spiritually. And then it's not as comical. Spiritually, you can read in this Bible, God hates pride. God hates pride. You read about pride being the downfall of others. You're reading here and you see the selfishness of your own life, how you're putting yourself first in every relationship. You look at the mirror, you see what kind of person you are, and instead of changing there, you leave unchanged, unrepentant, and you're the same person. It's just like that person with mustard on their shirt. Tim, you got a big old splash of mustard on your shirt, right? It's kind of growing fungus, and there's bugs eating it. I know, I saw that yesterday. <laughs> and, and I forgot about it. I looked in the mirror, and I forgot about it. Okay, we, you know, well, let's do something about it the next time you look at the mirror. The next day, you see it again. You just, you just keep wearing the same shirt and just everybody starts saying, this is, this is gross. That happens spiritually. You look at the word, you see pride. You don't deal with it. You don't deal with it. You don't deal with it. You don't repent. Let the word change you as we'll see. And it becomes an eyesore for other people. Or let's use the issue of anger person who has anger trouble, they're reading from God's word the danger of anger. They go into God's word that tells them, like a city that is broken into and without walls is a man who has no control over his spirit. But the same explosions happen over and over and over again. There's no change. They're hearing but not changing, and it becomes an ugly scene. It's like a doctor who gives a diagnosis, looks at the patient. You have this. X, Y, and Z needs to change in your life. In order to get rid of it, you're going to end up in the hospital. That person hears it, but then they don't change a thing. They'll end up in the hospital. God's word is that prescription. You're here, you come, and you hear God, and he gives you the problem. But instead of letting his word sink into your soul and change you through repentance and faith, you just leave 
Nothing changes. And eventually you're going to harm yourself spiritually. Why even go into the cocoon if you're just going to come out a worm? Caterpillar. Right? You hear the word, but you don't change. It's like these danger signs. You're seeing the signs. You're seeing the word. You're seeing the words, but there's no change. You're not slowing down. It goes to destruction. If there's no change of repentance, then there's no spiritual fruit worked in your life, as we'll see. It's like an out-of-control out driver seeing the danger sign but not heeding them. Richard was arrested for DWI. He was arrested a second time for DWI and no change. In May, we found him on the news because driving under the influence, he plowed into a crowd of folks in Times Square, injuring 22 and killing one. Right, he may have heard you got to change, but no change. No change. You're hearing the word now. Great! If God is working in your heart about something, we need to change. I'm going to be another sign on your pathway. Slow down! In that area, just slow down. Well, how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, he gives the positive reason that tells us how we can slow down and change. How am I to be a person who's changing, growing in sanctification as we're considering? Well, this is the person who's truly blessed. Look at the positive reason now. Again, the result of heeding is blessing. This person will be blessed in what he does. And so this is really the kernel of this sentence. The main idea of this sentence is, but the one who looks, he says a lot about that, this man will be blessed in what he does. That's the idea of the verse. I want to be fortunate. I want to be that person that God blesses. Well, this is how that happens. Two steps. Two steps. Look at the steps of blessing. They're twofold here. The first step is looking intently, looking intently. And he says, if you are to be a person blessed in what he does, changing what he does, you have to be looking intently. I like the New American Standard translation here that picks up on that increased, I think an increased um, from the first where you're just looking and you may be looking okay, but you pass along quickly. Now you're, you're looking intently. It's used in two resurrection Passages where those who were looking for the body of Jesus went and stooped and looked down inside the tomb. You're, you're stooping to look carefully. Well, that's what we do with the text, right? We're, we're stooping and looking very carefully at the mirror. It's not that you're looking at the mirror and seeing, eh, okay, and then you boom and you forget. You're, I mean, you're just kind of staring carefully. And then it, can, it goes on and say you're abiding beside it. You're not putting it away. You're, you're taking that mirror with you. You're, you're forever in front of the mirror, the Word. So you're looking intently, and then he goes on and describes what this is that we're looking at. What? Looking intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty. He's saying you're looking at the law. That is the same idea of verse 21 where he talks about it as being the Word implanted which saves our soul so it's this bible that's sown on our hearts and it saves us that's justification but as it saves us as we were just singing as we continue to gaze on it we're sanctified but you're continuing alongside it you're continuing to look at the mirror of god's law what is it that is his law and this is important look at these two describing words about the law, it's the law that is what? Intently at the what kind of law? Perfect law. Yeah, this law is perfect. This word, God's word is perfect. There is no moral blemish in it. There is no error in it. But I think the idea is even more than that. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. But the idea is complete. As we think of the word that is in Jesus, it is, it is all that is needed it's not that I'm waiting for more. This word is finished. I have it here as all the words of God that I need for life and godliness. The words of God are complete. The story is all told. 
God, who spoke in many different ways in the past, has now spoken in His Son, Jesus. And the Bible says in Hebrews there, that is the word we must pay much closer attention to now that He's spoken to us in His Son. This is the word of His Son, the complete revelation of God the Father to humanity, the completed story. It's perfect. The way God deals with humanity has been written completely in the coming of His Son, recounting the glory of God in Jesus Himself. We need no additions, no addendums, no substitutes. All that pertains to your life, you can find instruction there to equip you for it. How else does he describe the law here? It's the word that is what? The perfect law, and it's also the law of what? Liberty. It's the law of liberty. The idea is the law which gives liberty. The law which gives freedom. This is the word that gives you freedom. Gives you freedom. We'll think of carefully of that phrase. These aren't just words that we glance at and forget. These are the words of God. As he's describing the word to you that changes you, he describes it to you as the law that's perfect, the law of freedom, of liberty. You have a couple of ways that that's applied. It's freedom to, to live life God's way. There is in God's word and walk closely with it freedom of a joyful living. It's not a pain-free life. It's not a sorrow-free life. But it's life as God intends you to walk. And it's a joyful walk. It's a contented walk. If you find God's way for you and you're living it, it is real enjoyments. It is lasting satisfaction that is able to be steady even in pain, even in a hurricane. It is true, lasting joy no matter what I have, no matter who else I'm related to in this life. It's the illustration of a great yard. God has given us a beautiful, huge yard to play in. Grass, green, all these toys, as it were, to enjoy. But around this yard is a fence. And that fence is surrounded by a six-lane highway. And God's word is, in one sense, fencing us in to the the law of liberty, anything in that area, he gives you to enjoy. Enjoy yourself in God's good gifts. Rejoice in what he has given your hands to do in this life. But at times we're tempted to look at, but what about the fence? What's on the other side of the fence? Why does, why does God say, I can't do that? Why can't I live that way? And he knows. He's our Heavenly Father. He knows what's best. He knows what's on the other side of the fence. I've had two dogs. I've owned two dogs. One is Sheba and one's Ginger. They're both lavish. And, and there was a big difference between the two. Sheba, as soon as she got out of our house, the doors open, she, she's gone. Gone. Running like crazy in the street, all around neighbors, just causing a nuisance. And she loved to get free and go as fast as she could. And she would just taunt us. She'd run as fast as she could, as close as she could, without us getting it, and just tear off for another 10 minutes. But we knew it was dangerous. And the only way we could coax Sheba was with uh, candy. And so we'd take candy wrappers and rub them as loud as we can. Candy, it's peppermint, Sheba. And she would finally get close enough to where you could grab her collar. Ginger is completely different. Ginger uh, is a bigger dog, but, but she knows to stay behind our fence. Sometimes the fence is open, and there will be another dog over there, something she really wants to go get, but she knows she is not allowed beyond that fence, so she stays. That's awesome. That is a good illustration of what we should be. There's a, there's a lot to do in this yard. There is a lot of freedom and liberty. It's freedom and liberty to do what God allows you to do. And it's true joy. Find it. Pursue with all your heart in this life. But, but remember, there's a reason that he puts that gate there. It's freedom here. It's bondage there. It's bondage and deadly and destructive there. 40 mile per hour 
Cars and dogs do not mix. And God knows that in our lives. He gives us freedom in that sense, but it's also freedom to do God's will. It's not only freedom to know what it is that I can do, but it's also freedom to actually do it as we meditate and gaze on the glory of God that is changing us. It actually makes us, it allows us to do His law, His word. It makes me become a doer and not just a hearer. It changes me in that specific area of glory that I need to grow to the next area of glory in which I need to grow. It's not immediate, but it's amazing how it does it. As I look at God's law, I see the areas in which He wants me to grow, and as I abide in it, I remain in it, it actually becomes that which changes me from the inside out. I realize I'm lacking self-control. Read and hear that. But I read of God's patience with me. I read of how God can change me through His Spirit. And I read of it in His Word and I'm meditating on it and I'm seeing that His Spirit can change me as I'm not yielding to the flesh but letting the Spirit walk through my life and the fruit of self-control starts being perfected in my life and I start growing in self-control. I'm able to tell myself no even more and more. Because I'm repenting and I'm letting the mirror stay there. I'm seeing I'm a proud person. I'm saying, Lord, forgive me for my pride. Forgive me for living for self today. Give me grace to live for you. I'm looking at his glory. And I'm changing into his image because I'm saying, look how great God is. How can I think anything of myself? And so his glory is changing me. His glory is changing me in all these different ways. It's the word implanted that saves you. And so God actually gives us grace to no longer be slaves to our sin, but frees us from that. Romans 6, now you are free from sin. Your old master and you have become slaves to your new master, righteousness. I speak this way using the illustration of slaves and masters because it is easy to understand, Paul says. Before, you let yourselves to be slaves to impurity and lawlessness. Now you choose to be slaves of righteousness so that you will become holy. It's that God's word implanted that gives spiritual life, but it also that which continues to sanctify us as we gaze on God's glory in his word. It's kind of like the moon, right? The, the sun shines, uh, but, but at night we see the sun's reflection because of the moon, well, you and I reflect God's glory to our world in that way. And it's still darker, right? It's still imperfect, but God's glory shines on you. And you become a reflection, a mirror of that glory. And others say, wow, that guy's different. He's gentle. That lady is different. She's patient. She's joyful. How are they joyful? Because God's joy is being lived through them. Through God's power, you can start living. God, and I, this, I see this. This is so great about being a pastor. I see this in your lives. I see this in miraculous ways in people's lives. There's neat things when we pray and God heals someone miraculously. But you know what's also neat? When, when, when you pray and this person gets control over a life-dominating sin. That anywhere else you'd say there's no hope. But God gives victory. That's amazing. That's miraculous. And it happens over and over and over because the word of grace is changing us day by day as we grow in that area, not just looking at it, but abiding by it. Abiding by it, not becoming a forgetful hearer, but a remembering doer. A doer. I'll close with this illustration. Another very important text here as you are letting the words come into your soul and change you. It's like this. This is an illustration that God gives. Isaiah 55, 10. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making, he uh, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall be what? My word goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. 
a really neat picture. The rains come, and they fall on the ground, the seed that has been regenerated. Um, and, it, and then the water continues to fall, and that seed grows. And eventually it starts bringing forth fruit because the rain continues to fall. And God says, listen, as my rain continues to fall on your heart, as my word continues to be sown in your life, as you continue to reign in front of that mirror, doing the word, it just starts changing you. You start bringing forth fruit. It just happens. You'll start bringing forth fruit, the fruit of righteousness. It makes it fruit. Uh, it makes it bring forth and sprout. Do you see that? In the, let's see the verse 10. The water makes the earth bring forth and sprout. Right? Fruit comes. Why? Because God sends his word and it accomplishes that which he purposes, which is that fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Can such things, they're, they're not, there's no law. Are you gentle? I mean, as you bend down and you look at God's glory and you see uh, an aspect of fruit in your life, joy. God is joyful. Am I joyful? Would someone characterize me as a joyful person? Right? Am I someone who would be considered uh, kind, gentle? That person is at peace. That person is a peace, just shalom right there. Their life, they're just, just always steady at ease. Is it, would, would you be described that way? That is the fruit of the Spirit. We can think of this as God's word and we're seeing God's glory. It's almost like you're walking through a grocery store, the fruit market, and, and you're seeing this. You're seeing the glory of God's patience. And you're saying, God, I, I'm looking at this and I'm seeing this. I want that in my life. Dear Holy Spirit, make me a more patient person. I repent of my impatience. Change me through the power of your spirit. And you're meditating on that aspect and he starts to change you in that way. There are some fruit in our city that are downright unusual. Right, I've, I've used the illustration of it, it's kind of like you're uh, a child. You're a two-year-old and, and God is bringing you through his grocery aisle, the fruit aisle, and, and your legs are dangling there in the front and, and you say, Lord, I want that. What is that? I don't see that anywhere in New York City. Right. Um, that, that's gentleness. You never see that at work? Well, it's because there aren't many Christians around you. My spirit is not manifesting itself in gentleness around you. But that doesn't mean you need, never have that. There's a neat kind of neat thing about being in Queens. You see crazy vegetables from all over the world and fruit. What was that one, Diane, that you had in your backyard? It was, uh, it begins with an M. Debbie, I'm sorry, Debbie. What was it? Yeah. That one looks like something from Do from Dr. Seuss, right here. This is really interesting. I've never seen this before. I want that in my garden. Well, that's what we do: is we see God's glory, and we're seeing different fruit. You may not see it anywhere else, but it should be in your life. No one else. Everyone's so anxious around me, but I can be someone who is manifesting peace in trial and trouble. Because his fruit is being lived in and through me. So let me encourage you again. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Remain long by that word and take it with you to obey. I just We're out of time here, so I'm just going to be done. But um, let me encourage you. This is, this is why we give these out. These are our kind of uh, quiet time. Right? I think in the new year we'll be going through the booklet that, that we wrote to accompany this. But you can grab these booklets. This helps you with this. Um, there's, there's all these different reading programs, Bible reading programs in the back. But it's designed to help you think carefully about this. What I found in my own life is if I just read the Bible, I end up not letting it change me. I need to internalize these truths. And so what we do here is, is number one, you pray. Ask the Lord to open your heart. Number two, you read carefully. And then there's the date, the, what you read. 
And then you record. This is God's way of making you not walk away and immediately forgetting what you, you read. You have to record it. And there's three questions here that help you start to apply. Number one, what does the text say? And so you kind of write a little summary of that chapter that you read. Number two, what does the passage say about God? Again, we're looking upward to be changed into God's image, and we're seeing areas of His glory that I need to change in. And then number three, what does the passage say about how should I live today? And that becomes your liberty. That becomes your freedom. God has given me all the freedom to accomplish this today and all the power of His Holy Spirit to, to do it in my life. Lord, this is my to-do list, my most important to-do list. Give me grace by your Spirit to live this out today with joy. And it becomes a, really a, a, a thriving worship experience daily. I would encourage you to do that. Please, right, take these. We have a lot of them downstairs, and we'll order more if we need to. Uh, if you don't have something you're already doing to record, think carefully about this doing the Word and not hearers only. And as you do that, God will change you. God will change you. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Let's all do business with the Lord. And I mean, I mean change, right? We're here. Lord, what area do I need to change? Maybe he's given you a stop sign in this time. And I, didn't, I just dealt with a few things. I could have spent 20 minutes talking about different stop signs. But I mainly thought the idea of a stop sign, right? What stop sign has God flagged in your heart where you say, I need to change this? Lord... Give me grace to meditate on your word this week, to be changed in this area of my life. I've just been sinfully anxious, right? It's good to be concerned about certain good things, but I've been sinfully anxious about this area, and I know that's not what you want for me. I need to be at peace about this. Give me grace to throw my anxiety upon you and be a person of peace. May your fruit of peace. So let's all respond to God in this time. In a moment, Pastor Andrew will close us in prayer. But if you'd like to pray with someone, if you don't know that you have eternal life, forgiveness of sins through Jesus. I'll be standing at the back lobby and love to pray with you. But let's all pray internally. In a moment, Pastor Andrew will close in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you, O Lord, for your conviction. We thank you for the ways where you take the same passage of Scripture and you apply it to each of us in the way where we need it. Thank you for the times that you convict us, not just in a public setting like this, but even individually in our Bible reading times. And we ask for grace, Lord, please help us to, to be eager to obey what you show us. Give us patience, give us quiet of heart to be willing to settle and to be still before you. And give us an eagerness to obey. Lord, there's so much that you would desire to change in us for our good and for your glory. Please continue that work this week, we pray. Allow us to be blessed, truly blessed, with true, permanent, eternal fruit as we respond to you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll finish with this last song.